Hey, what is up? Welcome to this episode of the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Lofermento, and I've got a guest today who I can already tell that her energy about business is infectious. She probably loves business and entrepreneurship as much as I do, but her focus area is really powerful for every single one of us because it's about building your business sustainably, which for all of us entrepreneurs who we love working, we love injecting ourselves into everything, today's guest really puts it into perspective of how we can grow while not burning ourselves out while building processes and systems that can facilitate and enable that growth. So let me tell you about today's guest. Her name is Polly Buster. Polly brings over 35 years of experience as an entrepreneur and organization leader in the private, nonprofit, and government sectors. She's worked for the FDIC, local banks, a local nonprofit startup, and as a sole proprietor in the financial sector. She has experience with turnaround opportunities, startup organizations, and leadership leading various types of organizations, which makes sense as to why she loves business because she's seen so many different facets of it. We're going to glean a lot of insights from her here today. Polly founded her company to address the need for business owners to focus on building their business while being secure in the knowledge that business operations are functioning efficiently and at a high standard. Too often, businesses are limited by the demands on the owner for the daily operations. Doesn't that make sense for every single one of us? So Polly assists business owners in developing and implementing sustainable strategies and provides the guidance and oversight to free business owners from the limiting demands. I'm not going to say anything else. I'll tell you what, I personally am very excited to learn from Polly here today. I know we're all going to have a lot of takeaways. So let's dive straight into my interview with Polly Buster. All right, Polly, I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. I'm excited to be here as well. Heck yeah. Uh, You heard me tease listeners a little bit in the intro. I'm convinced you love business as much as I do. And I can see that because of your experience. Take us beyond the bio, though. Show listeners all these incredible experiences you've had. Tell us how the heck you got here. Well, it's been quite the journey. Um, I have spent over 30 years in different arenas, as you've described, in, in a variety of business sectors. So what I have noticed more often than not, even having been my own entrepreneur as well, is that many business owners often find themselves frustrated. They started a company, they're so excited about why they started the company, and then they get going along and all of a sudden they hate it. And they hate it because it is sapping their energy instead of giving them energy. They hate it because they're finding that they're doing so much more of the, we'll call it the business component, rather than what they really set out to do with their passions. I can't tell you how many times I have heard business owners tell me, you know, that if they if they knew then what they know now, they don't know if they would have ever start the business. It's just hard. And they lose sight of that passion. They lose that passion. And I find that extremely discouraging because I think that the, the entrepreneurs are the core. They are the core and foundation of our economy. They are the core and foundation of our innovation in this country. And we need entrepreneurs and we need them to be successful and we need them to thrive. So I founded Mimage. And, and what I do with this company is I use my broad, very eclectic background to work with entrepreneurs to figure out what is holding them back. And it could be anything from their processes to their their own personal beliefs about something to employees that they just can't get rid of because it's just too hard. And you'd be surprised. It is amazing how much energy, how much enthusiasm, how, how enjoyable a business is when we remove those burdens. It's just sometimes we can't see those burdens when we're in the middle of them, just like so many other things in life. And not only do we enjoy our business, suddenly it's thriving. It's thriving because we're having fun and we're doing the things that we need to for the business to be sustainable and that will allow it to thrive. That's what I do. 
Yes, I love that overview, Polly. And I think it really does show your passion. And so many listeners are going to resonate with this. I feel like you and I are just going to be two bundles of entrepreneurial excitement here on the air today. But I think at the heart of it is is such an important point that you've already made, which is I say this to listeners all the time. If you want to be a practitioner, owning a business may not be for you. If you're a physical therapist and you want to just do physical therapy, have a job as a physical therapist. You get to be a practitioner. But as a business owner, you need to do marketing. You need to do sales. You need to do management. You need to do all of these things. What are some of those things? Because hearing you talk about kind of doing the business things versus being the practitioner that so many people want to be, it's such different roles. Is that the way it needs to be? Is that the way it has to be? I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. So I think you have to recognize what you want your role to be. If you really want it to be the practitioner, then you need to find the bit, the support and, and people you trust to, to, that they can keep you apprised of the other matters. But truly a, a business owner in my mind needs to do a few things in particular. A business owner needs to be, really understand the workflow of whatever they, their business is. Because the workflow, and I mean that by organization workflow, because so often, we make decisions, especially as we're in a hurry, we're trying to manage chaos, there's um, a looming deadline, whatever those things are, the money is tight, we're trying to we're trying to juggle all the balls. We all have been through this, right? But if we lose sight of what we really have to do in our workflow, our organizational workflow, to produce the results that we need to produce to thrive as a business, then that's going to cause damage to that workflow and we're not gonna be as efficient. We're not gonna be able to produce the profitability we want. We're not gonna be able to produce the the, uh, culture or work environment that we want or need to be successful. So we have to really understand the organization's workflow and routinely assess it for continuous efficiency alignment because things change. And and so that would be the first thing. The second thing I think we need to do as business owners is we have to keep our eye on the ball. We have to understand how money flows because if money suddenly isn't working well, it isn't coming through in a timely fashion, it's not the timing is off for paying our bills, for meeting our payroll, that adds stress. So we need to be able to really understand our flow of money and different businesses have different flows, right? But but we all have a flow and we need to understand our timing so that we can make decisions in planning, just like we do with our personal budgets, so that we don't have the additional stress of where am I going to find money to make payroll? I, so we have to keep our eye on the ball. We have to, we, if someone else, if you hire someone to, to keep track and take care of payroll, manage the accounts receivable, manage the accounts payable, you know, even give you the timelines of when receivables are due to come in and what payables we have in that same time frame, so that you have an idea that's great. You're still keeping your t- your eye on the ball, but someone has to keep track of that for you. And then the, the other thing I think that we all need to do is we need to better understand. I have two more items, Brian. The first one is we need to better understand the story of, of our business. And, and, this, and what I mean by that is so often business owners need financing, whether it's working capital financing, um, some capital improvements, whatever that is. And we don't truly understand what we, what we're asking and what we can, what we can even get approved for. If we can understand the story that our business financials tell us, those simple QuickBooks financials can say a lot. And if we can understand those financials, then we can confidently know what should, um, what we should qualify for for a loan, how a bank might look at those financials. It'll, it, we will also confidently know what our financials are telling about our business because it might be different than what we think our business story is. And we need to reconcile that if it is. And the last thing I would offer is I really think all business owners um, would find that having a confidant outside of your immediate business um, to discuss business strategies, concerns, repu- and, and, or ideas without 
worrying about reputational risk, competitive risk, or business confidentiality risk goes a long way to, to having that support system around you, to have somebody else to bounce things off of. Because sometimes it can feel like it's really lonely at the top. Yeah, really powerful insights, Polly. And I'm going to argue that this is going to be a recurring theme of our content here in the show in 2024 because you're talking to us and I'd say you're really challenging us, not just as entrepreneurs, but I think more and more of our dialogue needs to be as business owners. And what I'm hearing from you here today, and and I think you have a really interesting vantage point because you are both a solopreneur, but you're also someone who has worked inside of and worked with people within big industries. I mean, the financial sector is, is one of the biggest industries of them all. So I think you have a really powerful vantage point there that you're sharing with us. And it is that challenge of being that business owner, understanding these things. And when I hear you say words like understand your business's workflow, Polly, I'm going to argue that a lot of, especially us solo printers out there, a lot of them are going to be like a workflow. I don't have a workflow. I just wake up and whatever's at the top of my to-do list, I hope to do that. And my to-do list continues to grow every single day. What the heck is a workflow? What does that look like so we can even start to understand it? Great question, Ryan. And um, so let me just use an example of something that we I just helped a business work through. We did an organizational work, um, or an organizational workflow chart. So instead of an org chart based upon this business is struggling with um, some timing of a couple things. They're struggling with some timing of, of, of receiving revenue. They're also struggling on making sure that they have the pipeline that they need to continue a sustainable revenue pipeline. So we worked on an organizational org workflow org chart. And when we did that, we, we started with no names could be discussed, right? And so then you'd look at what has to be done to accomplish the task of that business to get that revenue. And then you identify perhaps categories in which some of those tasks fall under. And, the, and you're not, you can't think about who is doing that today because that will, that will affect your, your thought process and will not get you to the most efficient place. So you want to really understand the steps it takes, how those steps might be delineated into work categories. And then how many of those work categories are similar enough that they might fit under a single job description. And then you identify those different job descriptions along that workflow line. Now you can look at the talents that you need and the skill sets that you need for those job descriptions. And you can determine if you have the right people or if, or if maybe there are people in your organization that better fit new job descriptions versus what they're doing. Or you might find that you have excess staff or you have um, people who really don't bring the talents and skill sets that you need today. That will then, that makes means you have to make some difficult decisions and that's when you have to get the emotions out of it. But if you can do that, then you can get a very efficient workflow process that will ensure that the steps are in place to make sure that your revenue is being driven to make you a sustainable organization. Yeah, I think it's a really powerful answer that's going to force listeners to look inwards because a lot of people don't have that. And I love how much there's two things that I love that you removed from that process, Polly, which is one, the people who are doing it because that's going to change, especially looking back at 2023. It was a breakthrough year for me in so many reasons, but one of which was I was able to hire across all my b- different businesses in my portfolio because it is that strategic, that intentional lens that I have the business foundation. And I was able to look through those lenses, just like you're challenging listeners to do here today. And the second thing that I really like that you're removing from this entire process is those emotions. Because Polly, listeners know we always ask our guests for their zone of genius. And you wrote for your zone of genius, identifying and removing the non-productive and emotional challenges. I want to hear that in your own term because, or in your own words, because I particularly love that term as well, non-productive, because there's a lot of things we do that are not productive obviously emotions start playing into that stuff what do those barriers and challenges look like to you what do you mean when you say that as a fellow entrepreneur sure for example a lot of times we tend to especially in our smaller businesses we become like family right 
And I'm just as guilty as anyone else. We become like family with our colleagues, with, with our employees. Um, and, and, and you, and we start, we get maybe three, five, 10 years down the road. Business is changing. Our business needs are changing. The, the, the demands on our own workflow processes are changing, but but Johnny, but Johnny's been with me for 10 years. I saw, I went to his wife's funeral. I went to his son's wedding, you know, and, and, and he's struggling right now. And, and I just, I know that he's not producing what I need him to produce, but I just can't do it. Well, you know, that's unproductive. It's unproductive from the standpoint of it's not helping Johnny because Johnny is not being forced to become um, face face to face with some of the own things that Johnny is going through to deal with, but also Johnny is not producing for the company, and and now the profitability is down, and I might want to sell my company, and I can't get my best value for the company because I don't have my best profitability that I should have. I've got, for lack of a better word, some dead weight there, and I can't get rid of it. And I know, I know in my heart, I need to make that change but I just can't because emotionally I'm tied to this person. And it's a very hard thing because we're all humans and don't get me wrong, I am not a cold blooded person. I just, sometimes I have to find a way to either find a place in the organization for that person to, to show that they can be productive and, and coach them through that. Or if they are not, I have to be willing to make the decision that I have to part ways and I'd like to keep the friendship, but if I can't, I can't. I mean, Sometimes we just have to make those decisions. And I'm working with a company with this right now, this very issue, and it's very hard. And I understand that it's hard for all of us. But if we really are going to be the leader we need to be in our business to ensure that we're making the best decisions for all the people that were responsible for their payroll, all of our clients, any other constituents we may have, our own families that are relying on us to bring home our the, the, the monies to live on, then we have to be able to find a way to compassionately make those decisions. Yeah. Again, thinking like a business owner. This is such a theme in today's episode. Polly, it's a big challenge from you to all of our listeners. And I love it because I think here in January, I think it's a really important message for every single listener to take to heart. Along those lines, I've obviously talked about your vantage point already, but I want to say for listeners, so your company, Mimage, you focus on businesses with annual revenue between a million dollars and $25 million a year. But you're also, I always say this, you're also one of us. You are a fellow solopreneur. So I think you have a really interesting perspective on what are the challenges that those types of businesses face sure. in the seven figure, multiple seven figure range. And then talking about the differences, but also I'm super curious to hear your perspective on the similarities. What are some of those differences and similarities from that solopreneur, maybe chasing a lot of listeners, chasing their first 10K a month versus those bigger companies that you work inside of? Sure. Well, certainly the similarity is we all have our challenges. We all have personal demands as well as one as well as dealing with clients and or customers and trying to determine our value as to what we're going to set our pricing at to ensure that we're making enough money so that we can meet our personal needs, but also so in our goals but also so that we can actually get the work because if you overprice, as we all know, and if you underprice, as we all know, those are both issues. And so I think, I think that's true for both businesses. I think solopreneurs tend to have a little less data and they tend to have um, a little less confidence in those decision makings um, and how they establish their business and how they establish their, their goals for, for revenue production and, and net profitability. The larger businesses tend to have a little bit more data. They've, they've, if they're that large, they tend to have been around a little bit longer. So they have a little experience on, on putting together the data as to what they think would fly or that they could um, reasonably charge or what they, or how to accept set expectations of clients and customers. I think solopreneurs sometimes get caught up in wanting to please everybody because they just need to get um, some business in the door and that can be exhausting and it can cause burnout and it can also um, 
dilute what the solopreneur is really offering. And so I think it's really important, especially for solopreneurs, but for all businesses to stay in our own lanes and really understand what those lanes are and where our value lies. Does that yeah, for sure. Because again, what I'm really hearing is that it just seems to me in so many ways that the way that you look at business is through that lens of intentionality. And I think so much of it comes from not only experience, of course, but I guess actually I want to th- talk to you with your confidant hat on because I think that <laughs> that sounds to me like in the work that you do, that is a particularly important hat for your clients when they get to interact with you is you are that third party. You are able to objectively look at businesses and see what's actually going on, which gives you that lens of intentionality. With that in mind, you've already kind of alluded to kind of the invisible barriers that may happen in our minds, whether it's emotional, we've talked about some of those things. But strategically speaking, what are some of those invisible barriers that we may not even realize that when you're that confident, you're thinking that confidant, you're thinking, my gosh, how do you not see this? Like this is holding you back. What are some of those things strategically? Sure. So um, so I think the important piece of a confidant is to know how to ask questions and to, uh, you have to understand the business and you have to understand the business owner and and what they, what their goals are and also some of their background so that you can, you can um, put your questions in ways that they understand, but I'll give you an example. So I was dealing with a um, business owner the other day and they keep complaining about how, uh, the production is a productivity situation. Productivity is way down. It seems to be down industry wide. They just don't understand. They keep throwing money at it that, you know, they they offer, they try to get the best talent, the best skill sets in their company and and they're going to improve productivity, but it's making them less competitive. It's, it's causing bottom line issues. And I looked at them and I, and my question was simply this, what motivates those employees? Right? And it's not, and, 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 and from their perspective, it should be money. And so they immediately was like, they really immediately responded that they, they're trying that, that they, they're paying them more. And I said, but maybe money isn't the motivator. And, and I think what we ha- what we tend to do is we, we're just trying to solve a problem and we're solving it with our own um, world's knowledge, not necessarily the knowledge or, or the world understanding of the world of the people that we're dealing with. And so we started working through that and, and I went out and I talked to some of the employees and, and I talked to some of the leadership in the company and we met again and, and came to the conclusion that we were gonna try a different method of establishing productivity goals and these are daily productivity goals for this particular company and we were gonna set them based on a higher than what our standards were, but we weren't going to call it that. We were just going to say, if you get this, this, and this completed, or you get this far down a line, um, you get to go home that day and you get paid for the full eight hours. And everybody was a little nervous about it. And they went out because it's not been done in their industry to their knowledge. And what has happened in the last month since this has been implemented is now we have people who are working together collaboratively as a team to accomplish the goal the productivity is, is um, being set at 10 to 15% better than standard and they're meeting it and they're going home early. We have happy employees and these employees talk to their friends in the business. And now we have top talent wanting to come to this company to work. This is a simple question. Oftentimes the solutions are simple tweaks. We just are caught in our own world and we just need someone to ask the question to make us think outside our world. Yeah, really strong point. And I'm a big believer that the right solution is almost always the simplest one. And quite frankly, I love that real life example that you gave us because a lot of times we take it on ourselves as entrepreneurs, as business owners to have those answers. But you just shed a tool from your arsenal right there. You shed some light on it, which is just ask, just ask the people who it's, who are involved with this, ask for what's right for them. And it's such a powerful tool for us to have. And also takes the onus off us to have all the answers because we don't, none of us do. So I love that. perspective. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I think that people think we're better problem solvers when we just ask and let other people solve these problems. So really good perspective from you there, Polly. The 
next way that I want to ask you this is you use that word collaboratively. And I know that that's such an important part of the way that you solve problems, the way that you work with people as a fellow solopreneur, which a lot of our audience is made up of solopreneurs. A lot of people look at the solopreneur journey and they think that it's lonely, but collaboration is such at the core of the way that you operate. I know that, for example, on your LinkedIn profile, one thing that really stood out to me is under your core strengths, you wrote communicates and builds coalitions. Polly, not everyone gets that impression of us as solopreneurs. Where's that approach come from? How do you, as a solopreneur, someone who gets to interact really with our clients, that's like the main role of being a solopreneur, where do those collaborative efforts come from and how do you incorporate it into your thinking and your strategies? Sure. Well, it comes from a lifetime of having to rely on some collaborative discussions to solve some big problems. But it also comes from, you know, when you're working with our clients, we have to collaborate with them. And sometimes some of their third party, like for me, I also need to work with their attorneys, their CPAs, and we need to collaborate as a team to, to get to the best solution. The other thing though, as a solopreneur, I may be a solopreneur, but some of my projects are pretty large and that'd be a lot for one person. I have a, I have a, an entire plethora of people I trust that are also solopreneurs, that we just joint venture it. And we pull together our different strengths, our different talents, and we put forth proposals that show us as one joint venture. And that allows us to keep our independence, our solopreneur status, and, 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 and be able to do our own other projects, but we also can come together and work collaboratively to meet the needs of prospective and, and actual clients. Yeah, that's really important insight. And I don't think it's one that a lot of people see behind the scenes of. So that's why here on this show, we're committed to showing people that real life picture of how businesses cooperate. Polly, I can't tell you how many times I've used that same approach where we all team up into the outside world. We may look like one company, but we all bring those different things to the table. So I absolutely love that. I knew we'd be short on time here today, but I'm not letting <laughs> you go just yet. I want to squeeze a few additional things in here. The first of which I think it's really important to talk about sustainability sustainable strategies because everywhere I looked to research about your business that is so at the core of your messaging and the way that you serve your clients obviously we all don't want to be in business for a short time we want to be in business for a long time and sustainability is an important thing there talk to us about that word what it means to you and most importantly what sustainable strategies actually look like as opposed to the way that short-term thinkers may view business sure so sustainable to me means multiple things. It means um, long-term viability, but it also means sustainable from the standpoint of the business owner can develop their life alongside their business and not feel like they haven't had a life or feel like they um, the company is sucking everything out of them. And so it needs to be allow the business owner to, to also develop. So I think when I talk to business owners about their sustainable, making some tweaks to make their business more sustainable, uh, th there's the obvious questions. There's the obvious questions, at least to me of, you know, are you financially viable? Um, what, are, what are the risks of your competitive risks? What are the risks of, of changes in some of our culture that could impact your company? And are you prepared to, to make tweaks and, and, and pivots to address those if you need to? Those, those typical uh, questions of, of risks to the company being successful or being able to meet their, their obligations. Then there's also the sustainability. Do you have a culture that is sustainable that you can attract the top talent because they're, they're happy to work there. They, they feel safe in offering their ideas and being part of the process of determining the workflow efficiencies because they have thoughts. They're the ones doing the work. And then there's the sustainability of the, of the owner that the owner has the ability to, to, to live that passion that they built the business around and also to be able to have their family life, their business life, go, go to the kids' concerts, not feel like they have to miss everything. And so th there's a, there's a multifaceted sustainability when I approach this with businesses. And, and we, and sometimes you have to start with the basic, it has to be financially sustainable to get to the other parts if you're not already financially sustainable, but if you are financially sustainable, then we can start digging deeper into those other um, sections 
of the business owner's life. Yeah, I'm so grateful, Polly, that you went there in that answer, because I think that this is a message that we need more in the world of entrepreneurship. And again, I'm going to challenge listeners so consistently over the span of 2024 to start stepping into that mindset of that business owner, because I think you are obviously you're an absolutely brilliant business mind. And I love hearing the way you think about these things. But I think it's a challenge for all of us to grow this year and to step into that role, because these are real life considerations. And and you really remind me, it's one of my favorite concepts and relationships in life and in business especially is that concept of those infinite games a finite game like a basketball game we know it's 48 minutes long and then it ends but business relationships life these are infinite games the point of the game is not for the game to be over it's to keep that game going and you use the word pivot and I think it's such a wise and obviously mature viewpoint for all of us to take on is to say you know what no matter what I'm gonna pivot I'm gonna make it work and I'm always gonna think like that business business owner. So I love those insights, Polly. I also love my favorite part of every episode. It's the hardest part for guests, which is for you to summarize something. For listeners who heard so many of these great takeaways, so much food for thought for all of our listeners, a lot of homework I think a lot of listeners are going to feel from here. What's your one piece of advice? What's the one thing that you hope everyone either sits with or you hope that they do after hearing these insights today? I really hope that everyone understands it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Although it can sound overwhelming, it can feel overwhelming. Even in our conversation today, we spoke about a lot of different things that you have to think deeply about. It doesn't need to be overwhelming. Build a support system that you can use to bounce ideas off of that will be straightforward and honest with you and thoughtful so that you can share the ups and downs with, celebrate the successes, get some support when when there's some down times. Because if you will do that, then you will be able to, to look at workflow. You'll be able to reassess staffing. You'll be able to look at all those things and not feel so overwhelmed. Yeah, really powerful advice that only comes from us taking that step back, whether it's doing it ourselves on a weekly, a monthly, a quarterly basis, or having that confidant in our corner like you're able to do, Polly, with your clients through your business. I think it's really powerful advice. With that said, I just want to toot your horn a little bit more here today because I think it's so incredible. As I was doing research for today's episode, obviously, I was on your business website, on your personal LinkedIn, and I want to invite listeners, so much of the resources and especially the wording. You're so intentional about the way that you position yourself in the marketplace. It really shows the things that you think about in the way you communicate your services and the gaps that you fill for your clients. So listeners, I invite all of you to check out Polly's business website, to add her on LinkedIn, to check out all the amazing things that she's doing. So Polly, on that note, the stage is yours. Drop those links on us. Where should (laughs) listeners go from here to learn more about you and your business? Thank you, Brian. So you can find my um, webpage at M-I-M-A-G-E dot cloud. And you can look me up, Polly, P-O-L-L-Y, Buster, B-U-S-T-E-R on LinkedIn. I would love to hear from all of you. Love your feedback. Love any other thoughts you have, anything you think um, I should add to my list of things I'm looking at. Uh, It's all collaborative. So thank you all very much. Yes, I love that attitude, Polly. Listeners, you know we're making it as easy as possible for you to find Polly and her business website. So scroll on down wherever it is that you're tuning into today's episode. Her business website is at mamage.cloud. You'll find that link down below as well as a link to her personal LinkedIn. Do not be shy. 99.9% of listeners are too shy to ever reach out to people that they hear on podcasts, not just our show, but literally anything that we consume as content consumption consumers. So be one of the ones that reaches out. You hear how collaborative Polly is in her approach. Grow your business network. That's the name of the game this year. There's so many brilliant minds out there. So on that note, on behalf of myself and all the listeners, Polly, thank you so much for being so generous and sharing all of this with us here today on the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here.